want to start first by acknowledging <coughs> uh, Cliff Robley, who was kind of the, uh, you know, who spearheaded this whole project and wanted uh, some kind of an expert opinion on something that Caltrans was funding. Uh, the the, uh, the Caltrans funded project was actually uh, at at Georgia Tech, you know, uh, Reggie was initially at Georgia Tech, he's now moved on to Rice, so I've listed uh, him here at Rice University. But it's really a large group of people at Georgia Tech who looked at a fairly extensive database of uh, bridge, uh, bridge column experiments and trying to come up with some data from that. <coughs> uh, and so like I said, so this, is a, uh, so this project is funded by Caltrans, and then what uh, uh, Cliff, who actually managed this project, wanted was some kind of an expert opinion uh, on some of the uh, uh, you know, capacity models, as we call them, for these uh, bridge uh, components. All right, so let me quickly give this. So this is kind of an overview of what uh, this uh, workshop was about and what the goals were and what we were able to accomplish. <coughs> so I don't know, I guess most of you know about Shakecast. And so really the effort here, I think, uh, is to come up with the next generation of uh, bridge uh, system physically functions. Uh, and so here you're looking both at demand models all right, and also capacity limit states. Okay, so this is kind of the focus of what uh, this particular uh, workshop was on. It was, you know, it was about capacity limit state models uh, that could be used. <coughs> um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to go over the the, uh, the workshop itself. Uh, and so, like, uh, just talking quickly about Shakecast for those of you who you know, are probably not that familiar with. So, what happens as soon as an earthquake occurs? Uh, Shake Map. I think this is part of USGS. They quickly provide. Uh, a distribution of the ground shaking within a few minutes uh, of the earthquake. And so then what uh, Shakecast then does is determines bridges uh, that fall into this uh, categories of this uh, shaking <coughs> and then identify bridges that are most likely to be damaged. And so, you know, uh, Caltrans can send out its crews out to those uh, uh, sites that are vulnerable to, to bridge damage. <coughs> so that's kind of what, uh, you know, the overall goal of Shakecast is. Um, it's composed of actually two parts, like I said, there's the shape map part, which gives you the ground motion data, uh, and then, of course, the bridge fragilities themselves. <clears throat> and so it's a question of putting the two together, and what we are focusing on is, you know, one little part of this portion on the right. <clears throat> so the question is, why update Shakecast? Well, uh, currently, uh, you know, they use HAZIS, and it only has like two to five classes of bridges. And the only kind of information I was told that was in these, uh, in the database is simply the, uh, the time, you know, the time it was built, so the error here, the type of bent, and the frame type. So that's about the only information that is currently in hazard. So they have no information about, you know, uh, the, the dimensions of the columns, you know, the, uh, the spans of the bridge, and nothing like that. So, so some of the work that's going on at UCLA would be, you know, kind of useful to, you know, to enhance this database, for example. <coughs> so the question is, do we classify all the bridges into just one bridge class and be done with it? Or, you know, each, you know, we, we assume that each bridge has its own fragility, which means you have 24 or 25,000 different models. All right, so obviously this is unrealistic and this is too simple, so the idea is to come up with something uh, in between. All right, so in terms of the overall project that Georgia Tech was involved in, you know, as you can see, there are these uh, seven phases here, starting with the ground motions. Uh, you know, the uh, the bridge you know, simulating the bridge models themselves, coming up with uh, you know final element models of the bridges, uh, and then coming up with the response of these bridge components, and eventually coming up with your uh, probabilistic demand models, uh, and then here is where you want the component capacity limit states, uh, and finally to you know to come up with your fragilities. And so, like I said, the workshop focused on just this one little uh, piece of this larger project in terms of identifying whether the capacity limit states, in which in this case was defined to uh, deformation capacities, you know, whether they were reasonable or not. <laughs> right, so, so CCLS is the compo compon component capacity limit states. And so like I said here in the beginning, so what Georgia Tech did was to assemble this fairly large database of column tests uh, from the literature and come up with these limit state definitions. All right, and then to come up with a model to map uh, you know, when I use the word limit states here, they're essentially deformation limit states, uh, you know, to, to damage states, all right? And then, so here's what, where the workshop comes in, is to assemble a panel of experts to review this process data and to recommend some of these model values, mm -hmm. all right? 
And then after the workshop, the, you know, the task ongoing is to re-examine the, the original model values and see uh, and the damage states and to see how we can update them based on the recommendations of the panel. <clears throat> okay, so, th and the, so the next step really is to conduct a brand new survey and to kind of uh, finalize these uh, capacity limit states for Shakecast. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit more about uh, the database itself. So these are selected column tests primarily from the US and some from New Zealand. Um, and again, I think you saw some of this in the, uh, the UCLA presentation. Uh, the columns were grouped into three different design code errors and three failure modes. So we had uh, the, you know, flexure, shear, and you know, in some of the older columns you'll see that, you know, we also had something called a lap splice failure because they used to lap the, uh, the longitude reinforcement right at the, at the base. And so these are like some extremely old columns. Uh, and so the decision was made at some point, I guess, along the project that displacement ductility would be used uh, as the primary measure for, uh, for establishing these uh, limit states. Uh, you know, and, and so again, like I said, so, you know, uh, so based on the literature review, they came up with these uh, limit states and they then tried to map them onto predefined damage states. So quickly about the columns themselves. So what Caltrans did was to take some, uh, you know, typical, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Uh, drawings that they have of some of these bridges and you know classify them like I said into errors based on the transverse uh, you know reinforcement spacing the amount of transverse reinforcement and like I said in some cases they even had lap splices at the base huh? all right the error two which is the next uh, uh, you know time period like you know like was already mentioned for San Fernando but pre uh, uh, Loma Prieta you can see there's more transverse reinforcement in these columns and finally the third so-called the modern era uh, where you know you'll probably see much more well-detailed columns uh, and a lot more transverse reinforcement. So these are the three uh, you know broad groups of classes you know, in which the columns were classified. Uh, and like I said, uh, also we had you know three or four different failure modes. Mm -hmm. uh, quickly here, so these are the damage states. Uh, you know, starting all the way from CDST zero one. Uh, you know, so you'll see all these numbers. So these are the primary damage states and. The ones that you see in between are the intermediate states. So there's a whole bunch of these damage states. And here you will see some description of what these damage states mean, all the way from the appearance of vis uh, you know, visible flexural cracks uh, to spalling, you know, uh, exposed core, buckling, all the way. So this is uh, an example of, I think this, this is just the flexural damage state. There was a similar one for shear as well. All right. So the, the job was then to, 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 to look at the experimental database look at the, the you know, ductility in this case, or the deformation limits, and see where to place uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, these different damage states and limit, and, I mean rather, compare the damage states with the limit states. <clears throat> so one of the additional things that was defined in the project was something called design failure. Again, this is a term that Cliff came up with. Uh, you know, most tests are typically stopped at a certain point. You, know, you rarely take a test in the laboratory all the way to collapse. Uh, and so one of the typical standards that we use is to stop a test when the lateral capacity dropped to about 80% of the peak. And so that was then defined as something called design failure. So the idea here is that beyond this, most columns probably still have some reserve capacity. Uh, and hazards, for example, you know, uh, requires a collapse limit state, which means they also want a damage state at almost at near collapse. And so that you know, is pretty uh, typically not captured in an experimental test. <clears throat> So, uh, like I said, so what they did was look at this large database, establish the design code error based on the, uh, you know, based on the details in the specimen, like the reinforcement data, the transfers reinforcement, and so on. And so they assigned it to a certain design error. Uh, then they found, you know, they had to define something called the idealized yield displacement. Because remember, like I said, they used ductility as a measure for these limit states. And so to get a proper a measure of ductility, they needed to define a yield displacement in a standard way so that they could apply them to all the tests in the database, all right? And then to find the displacements corresponding to the different uh, limit state thresholds which map these, uh, you know, damage states. And also to identify the so-called failure point, which are, like I said, is the 80% of the peak capacity, which is really not collapsed, but something that is typically defined, uh, you know, as a design failure. And so for all, each of these damage states to then, you know, compute the ductility values. <coughs> So in all, like I said, uh, you know, we had three errors. We had flexural failure modes in all of them, shear failure modes in all of them, and only in the in the, in the earlier error, they also had 
the elapsed uh, splice failure mode as well. <coughs> All right. So, so the typical data that was provided. So, so what we did then was to assemble. So this is part of the test that I was involved in is to assemble a group of people to look at this data and to see if the initial effort of Caltrans uh, to classify these damage, I mean these limit states with the damage states was reasonable or not. So the data provided to the panels included the raw data for all the columns and as you can see you have all the information uh, that was taken from the, uh, you know, from, the, from the experiments. And then we provided them these um, mapped damage states. So as, can, as you can see here, you have CDST01, so that's the, the earliest damage state all the way to uh, you know, design failure. All right? and there was some in which there was no test data, so they were essentially blank. All right? And so we filled some of these numbers in. Uh, and like I said, and so we had these damage states uh, and the corresponding ductility values uh, you know, for each of those columns, for each of those errors. All right? So this is a fairly large undertaking. And so you know, the panelists, I guess, had uh, a lot of information so what we did was to further process some of this, uh, <coughs> or this information. And so what Cliff essentially did was to take all of this data for flex, for shear, for all of these design errors, and to come up with these little plots where you have on the vertical axis the displacement ductility, uh, and on the horizontal axis the percentile of the reported observations. So essentially, if you went right down to the 50%, you would get like a median observation of what the ductility is for the different damage states. So each of these lines represents a damage state all the way from you know like visible cracking all the way to to failure all right and so you could pick out both the median values and the dispersion if you went to the 10 and 90 percentile okay, that those were the target values that we wanted the panelists to come up with we wanted them to estimate based on the data provided to them what would be their best estimate of the median capacity as well as the 10 and 90 percentile you know to give you a sense of the dispersion in the experimental data and as you can see it's you know in the lower damage states, the dispersion is not all that much, but as you go into the higher damage states, you get a fairly large dispersion. <clears throat> so this is for flexure, for error three, and likewise, oops, I have this, okay, I'm sorry, this is the other thing. So what, an additional thing that uh, Cliff did, this is all of the data, and so some of the data included bridge and uh, building columns as well, all right? And the reason they included is because, you know, the initial objective was to get as many data points as possible. Then he kind of, filtered out some of the points and uh, this top queue is the top quality data uh, in which the uh, both uh, the, the transverse reinforcement and also the axial loads corresponded more closely to the type of you know co columns that Caltrans were building so you know some of these data included fairly large axial load ratios and typically Caltrans column sees about 5 to 15 or 20 percent uh, in terms of axial load ratio so all of that the other data were taken out and so you have you know the so-called top quality so the, so the panelists had access to all of the data and also to the so-called top quality data so they could make an educated guess about what uh, those median values and dispersion could be. So this is what the pre-workshop survey was. We sent this out to all the panelists and they filled out for each of these damage states. And again, they didn't have to fill out all of the columns. They just needed to fill out the columns that they felt comfortable with. So they you know, put some numbers in each one of these. So for you can see here, error one, two, three, you had, uh, you know, yeah, this error one, two, three, uh, and then there's the, you know, the combined model, the flexural model, the shear model. So the idea was, could we use one model for both flexural and shear? I mean, this, there was some reason for doing that, you know. Uh, as structural engineers, we say there's no way you can combine flexural and shear together. But what was interesting when you look at all of the data is that in terms of ductility, uh, you know, quite often, you know, even a shear column would have about the same level of ductility, even though the overall drift was smaller, that you could actually combine all of them into a single model. Okay, so again, the goal that Cliff had here was to come up with some simple way of combining all of this information so that he could then, you know, come up with these capacity limit states and then put that into shape cast eventually. So here's a quick uh, summary of what the results were. So what I'm showing you here for one particular case is this error one flexure. Uh, these were the, the, uh, the data that, that the Caltrans calibrated, which you know, actually Cliff individually did that. So the blue lines indicate the median, which is the 50 percentile, and the 10 and 90 uh, for the different damage states all the way from the lowest to the highest. And the red are the, uh, the median values picked by the, the panelists. And so it's very interesting that the data we provided, as you can see in the early damage states, you know, it pretty much coincided with the actual data that was provided. But the panelists tend to be a little bit more conservative when it came to the higher damage states. And so you could see the median values are much lower uh, and the dispersion would typically tend to be a little bit higher as well. 
So this is the initial kind of data that we wanted. Uh, and so we had you know, discussions about these things as well. It was not just that you know, the panelists came up with the numbers, but we also wanted to have a discussion about what were some of the issues. Uh, and so some of the things that the panelists discussed were things like the definition of the yield displacement. Because obviously, if you use ductility as a measure, depending on where you place that yield displacement, you, know, you could get fairly different ductility values. <coughs> And particularly its impact on the lower damage states. So if you picked a fairly low uh, you know, value of yield displacement, you'd start to see a lot more damage happening much more earlier than in the real experiment. <clears throat> and then what were some of the factors that affected some of these models? Okay? For example, the type of test done, you know, the system parameters involved. Okay? But the, the, the question really was where all of these factors, remember there are a lot of factors obviously that, that uh, affect a test, but the question is, does the dispersion that we observe, you know, in the models that I just, you know, showed in the previous slide, is that sufficiently captured, you know, I mean, do those variations, you know, uh, is that adequately captured by the dispersion, in which case we really don't uh, care much about the factors that influence these tests. Okay, like I said, the other, uh, you know, discussion centered around this concept of life safety versus design failure, okay, like I said, design failure is something that typically experimenters define you know, as a point to stop the test, and that typically is about, 80% of the peak lateral capacity, but in reality, you know, you know, in fact, one of the presentations was in this shaking table test that was done in San Diego, where clearly, you know, you saw that, you know, a whole bunch of bars, you know, ruptured, buckled, but, you know, the column just still didn't collapse, you know, was able to take several more earthquakes, you know, after the point. So clearly, there's a lot more reserve capacity in a bridge uh, than, you know, after a particular damage state defined by, say, things like bar buckling and, and, and bar rupture and so on. <coughs> So, there were some recommendations made to revise some of these damage state definitions uh, and also some recommendations uh, to reclassify the area and the failure modes. All right, so, so we're going into the workshop, we had, as you can see, nine different groups, uh, you, know, uh, you know, errors and failure modes and so on. And at the end of the workshop, you know, we recommended that we need no more than five to kind of, you know, bring them to a more manageable group. <coughs> Um, and likewise, another effort that has gone on actually since the workshop is to come up not just with you know the, these new damage states, but some visual uh, images to go with each one of them, so that you know when we put them in the database, you know remember the, at the end of the day, uh, you know some of the damage state classification is done by people going onto the site, and so if they have some visual images, they can then place these damage states in the appropriate categories as well. <coughs> so we had one for flexure, we have a similar one for shear. <coughs> And so right now, as we stand, uh, like I said, we've, we've uh, classified the failure modes, uh, you know, and the so-called version two model values are now being updated based on the panel recommendations, like I said. So now we have a smaller group of bridge column, uh, uh, bridge classes, and so we want to go back into the data and redo those uh, fragility curve, not the, the, uh, the percentile distributions, and come up with new model values. And then the plan is to send out another survey to the, uh, to the panelists and to see if there are going to be any more changes. <clears throat> All right, and so these new results will provide the new so-called CCLS models. Um, and of course, the next steps are for Caltrans and, and Shakecast. I mean, this is outside the scope of the workshop, but this is for the benefit of information for, for those of you that eventually all bridge systems in, you know, in the Caltrans inventory are going to be classified. Uh, you know, nonlinear simulations of these bridge classes are going to be carried out. Uh, and, you know, and of course, then you come up with your demand models uh, and then finally update your models and shape cast. Right, and see, I think that's pretty much all what I have for my presentation today. Right, thank you. Thanks, uh, Sashi. This is uh, really useful. Any, any comments? Sashi? I, I have a comment. I mean, some some years ago, and I'll take advantage of being having Professor Der Corrigue here, uh, he has developed some probabilistic capacity models uh, using Bayesian updating. So I wonder if this new data can help in, in refining the model even more. Uh, it was, would sure. that be something? That I, I am sure. I mean, I think all models need to be updated as you get new experiment. <laughs> You know, so you start off with a, an initial database and you come up with a model, right? And as new data becomes available, I think, you know, some model, you know, some of these updating needs to happen. Uh, and so if there are, you know, some tools out there to do that, I'm sure, you know, Caltrans would be interested. But these capacity models fit very well with what the workshop was looking at yeah. because they are 
mainly phenomenological models that uh, modeling errors were added and updated based on, on the data set that we had at that time. Really? So this which was is the column database? Which from is the column database. Yeah. But now there is a new data that yeah, actually you. structured in a, in, a, in a more useful way to do the model updating, I think, because we had to use a lot of judgment at that time. Right. Uh, some of the tests were stopped earlier than because of stroke limitation, yeah. like some of the NIST exactly. work, if you're familiar right, with that. Right, exactly. Yeah. But it looked like a lot of this had been taken care of here. Plus some new failure modes that weren't looked at, like splices and so on. Right, um, first, please. Professor Musalam was a part of that study. Yeah, but <laughs> I didn't want to say that. And it was uh, Paolo Cardone's. Yes. Uh, but one place I don't uh, agree with you is that we had to make judgment. Because only on the data. The test, we didn't make judgment. If the test did not go all the way to failure, we, Censored we, it. we properly interpreted that. You see, that's why I said you let go. Yeah, so it, it was not a judgment, it was a mathematical description of not having reached failure. Yeah, basically, all right. So you only had... I think yeah, this is a very good idea, that in light of... These were for bridge columns. Yeah, right, so this is also all bridge columns only, yeah? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in fact, it, it might be quite interesting to see... Okay. The yeah. size of in the data of is bigger. new data, you can... Certainly, you can... Update, we can certainly uh, go back. You said uh, Paolo Gardoni's work, you said, or was that part yeah, of the report? Yeah, that was PhD. Okay, yeah. So we can certainly look at that. Look at the cheer and Fletcher. Yeah. Yes, Sylvia? I was talking to Mark Nickelhart a couple of days ago. He's been working on that database yeah. still. He's yeah. still updating it yeah. now, it's just on his computer. Uh -huh. And so yeah. you might want to get in touch with him to really get the latest update, because I know he just keeps adding to it. But we talked to his student in the ERI meeting that was in Portland. Yeah. Update, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know how much parallel work is going on, but I know that Caltrans did use the peer database as well. They started, I think, right? I'm not sure if Tom knows how much of the data, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people having their own database. It'd be good if we can somehow bring them all together, you know? And I'm sure UCLA can benefit from, from the database as well. Eh? Okay, any other comments, questions? Thank you, Seth. All right. Well. Uh,